welcome back to the afternoon session, the final afternoon session for the London Farm Show. We appreciate you joining us for the last few days, and we've got um, a real stellar lineup to kind of close out uh, the Farm Show and close out the rest of the afternoon. Our first guest of the afternoon is going to be John Gowdy, who uh, has, I know, certainly a topic that I think a lot of us farmers probably think about in the back of our minds. Maybe it's not the priority, the first thing we think about all the time, but man, when it comes to agricultural rights and the law here in Ontario, um, it's definitely one that, you know, kind of floats in the back of our mind. And, and really, um, I'm glad to have you, John, to be able to describe, uh, you know, some of these things that we need to be thinking more of. Um, this uh, session is generously sponsored by TD Canada Trust Agricultural Services, and we certainly thank, thank them for supporting the farm show. Uh, so, John, you're with Scott Petri LLP um, and speaking on, as I said before, agricultural rights and the law in, in Ontario. Take it away, John. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to participate in the London Farm Show Connect this year. I'm sure I can speak for uh, all of us when I say I'd far rather be participating in person, but uh, hopefully it's a, a positive thing because since I'm the first speaker after lunch, uh, hopefully everyone at home had a little less to eat and uh, might be more alert for a discussion about legal issues, which can be pretty dry. I've uh, attended the Western Fair Farm Show on and off over the years uh, for just about as long as I can remember or as long as I can remember. I grew up on a cash crop farm north of London. I went away to university. I, for some reason, went to law school. And then I came back uh, to the farm and I've been there ever since. I now spend a portion of my year trying to juggle my law practice and farm work. And uh, every time, every once in a while, I get caught driving uh, farm machinery in dress shoes. And uh, there's a photo there uh, as well of my youngest daughter, Jane, uh, with me a few years ago when we were taking off wheat. Whether it's transactional work or regulatory compliance or litigation, agriculture involves legal issues and legal problems. And I, I like to think that my active involvement in agriculture allows me to provide good service to my clients and to understand their situations uh, more than if I were not farming myself. And hopefully I'm right about that. For today, I've been asked to speak about four specific topics, trespass and liability, checkerboarding, uh, easements, and underground oil and gas storage tanks. And in the time available, what I'd like to do is give, give you a very brief overview of each topic and some key points. Um, but I can assure you that there's a lot more information out there on each topic that I will not get to today. Nevertheless, it's important for the agricultural community to have at least a summary knowledge of topics like the ones I'm discussing today. I've heard it said that a little knowledge is dangerous, um, but I've also heard from Donald Rumsfeld, uh, famously or infamously, that there are known unknowns. Uh, there are things we know we know. Uh, we also know there are known unknowns. Uh, that is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. And there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know that we don't know. And my view is that it's helpful to be aware about legal issues that affect agriculture, at least in a general sense, so that you know when you need to seek legal advice and get more information. You want to be in a position of knowing what you don't know. <clears throat> the most dangerous situation is where you don't know uh, what you don't know. So, Let's start with trespass and occupier's liability. Trespass has a number of meanings. Uh, the main ones to think about today would be unauthorized entry onto property or unauthorized interference with property. An example of unauthorized entry that comes to my mind is the guy on the motorbike that I've seen drive out of the bush at the back of the farm from time to time. Uh, an example of unauthorized interference might be a neighbor or someone else depositing materials onto your property 
could also be contamination migrating uh, onto your property from a neighboring property. Today, I'm just gonna talk about the first example, the unauthorized entry. There's legislation in Ontario called the Trespass to Property Act, and that law makes it an offense uh, to, sorry, uh, an offense to uh, enter onto premises where the entry is prohibited by the act. And you can post signage or some other type of notice on your property, a no trespassing sign, for instance. And by doing so, you trigger the prohibition on entry in the trespass legislation. Farms are given special treatment under the legislation. You don't have to post a no trespassing sign in order for unauthorized entry to be prohibited under the Act. Uh, without any notice on premises, uh, entry is prohibited to a garden, field, or other land under cultivation. And that includes woodlots on land that's used primarily for ag agricultural purposes. Entry onto land is also prohibited where the land is enclosed in a manner that indicates an intention, <coughs> excuse me, to keep people out. So a fence would be that type of enclosure. Again, a farm doesn't have to be fenced in order for unauthorized entry onto the farm to be a trespass and an offense. Additional new legislation was enacted last year uh, to deal with the protection of farm animals from interference. The legislation is called the Security from Trespass and Protecting Food Safety Act. The purpose of this legislation is to prohibit trespassing on farms and other properties where farm animals are present and to prohibit interference with the animals. The Act refers to animal protection zones, and those include enclosures for farm animals. This new Act prohibits anyone from entering an animal protection zone without prior consent of the owner or the occupier of the farm. The Act also specifies that no one is to interfere or interact with the farm animal uh, within an animal protection zone without prior consent. The Act says that the Trespass to Property Act does not apply uh, to animal protection zones. The intention there is not to remove protection from those uh, areas on farms, but rather to enhance the protection for those specific areas. So when it comes to animal protection zones, the Security from Trespass and Protecting Farm uh, Food Safety Act will apply. For all other trespass on farm properties, the General Trespass to Property Act uh, would apply. So think back to my example about the, um, the guy on the dirt bike racing out of the bush at the back of the farm. Trespass is prohibited by legislation unless, unless the owner of the property authorized uh, that entry. But that's rarely going to come into play because most of the time you're not going to meet up with a trespasser and you might not even be aware that someone has trespassed on your property. A valid concern though is what happens when someone trespassing on your property is injured or suffers some kind of damage. Are you as the owner or the occupier of the land going to be liable for that injury or damage? It depends. There's a law in Ontario called the Occupiers Liability Act that sets out the duties of owners and occupiers of land to ensure the safety of persons and property entering onto the land. The Occupiers Liability Act basically covers any land and property or building that you occupy. As an occupier, you owe a duty to take such care as is in all the circumstances reasonable uh, to see that the people who come onto your property and the property that they bring onto your property uh, are reasonably safe. A good example to think about, though it's not agricultural, would be a shopping mall. Customers are invited to come to the shopping mall to do their shopping and the, the owner of the mall and the operator of the mall uh, have a duty to take reasonable care to protect 
the people coming into the mall from being injured. So for instance, a, a slip and fall injury. That duty though, uh, does not apply where someone willingly takes the risk or willingly assumes the risk when they enter onto the property. And as in the trespass legislation, farmland is given special consideration in the uh, Occupier's Liability Act. When someone enters onto a rural premises used for agricultural purposes, uh, including a woodlot, they are deemed to have willingly assumed all risks. So basically, if a person is a trespasser under the Trespass to Property Act, then the duty of the occupier to take reasonable care to make sure that that trespasser is reasonably safe does not apply. Just go back to the slide before. However, there is still a duty on the part of the occupier of farmland uh, and generally not to create a danger with the deliberate intent of doing harm uh, or damage to the person or his or her property uh, and not to act with reckless disregard of the presence of the person on the property. So while you might not have an active duty to take reasonable steps to keep the person reasonably safe, you can't actively uh, put that person in harm. You can't set traps on land. That's uh, illegal. And, and there's no exception to that for farm properties. Jump to the next topic, uh, checkerboarding. And what I will put up on the screen now, it's an excerpt from the 1878 Atlas of London Township showing the, uh, the specific area where I come from. And as you can see, the countryside was divided into concessions and lots. And some of the lots were divided again into part lots. Checkerboarding is a term that has been used in the past in connection with dealings in property and efforts to avoid the effect of subdivision control on property under the legislation called the Planning Act. Historically, back in 1878 and, and even later than that, a landowner could divide his or her land by selling off pieces to, to purchasers or giving portions away. You could have a 100 acre farm lot and uh, decide to transfer 50 acres to a child and retain 50 acres. And back uh, prior to the Planning Act legislation, you didn't need any special permission to do that. You simply made the transfer. Um, but if you acquired another parcel of land uh, adjacent or abutting your, adjacent to or abutting the land that you already owned, and you took title to that land in, in the same name, uh, then those two parcels merge in law and effectively become one parcel. And uh, that, that applies even if, uh, sorry, but before subdivision control, uh, you could still then reverse that merger and divide the land up again and transfer some off. Under the Planning Act and under subdivision control, you can no longer subdivide land without municipal consent. Here's the basic uh, prohibition under the Planning Act. Uh, it says no person shall convey land by way of deed or transfer uh, or grant, assign, or exercise a power of appointment uh, or mortgage or charge land or enter into any agreement that has the effect of granting the use of or write in land for a period of 21 years or more, so for a permanent period, uh, unless, and the unless is, you need municipal consent. You need a municipal consent to sever land uh, if it's subject to subdivision control. And as you probably know, the, uh, the, the opportunities for severing farmland in Ontario are uh, rather limited. The Planning Act and subdivision control are, are things that you cannot afford to ignore. And the reason is that a contravention of the Planning Act is fatal 
to a conveyance. As the act says, an agreement or conveyance or mortgage that contravenes the planning act does not create or convey any interest in land. So you may enter into an agreement thinking that you're getting something and if there's a contravention of the act, you don't actually get what you uh, think that you have uh, agreed to. What you can't do in basic terms is deal with one piece of property uh, while you retain an abutting piece of property. Um, going back to what I said before about the merger of adjacent parcels, if you owned one farm and an, a, a number of years ago you bought the neighboring farm and you took title in the same name, so it, say you purchased it personally and you owned the original parcel personally, those properties merged and became one property. And, and that applies even if the two uh, former parcels still have separate tax roll numbers. They, they merged uh, for the purposes of the Planning Act and subdivision control. I'll just put up on the screen uh, a simple diagram of four parcels of land, A, B, C, and D. If you owned parcel A and you were thinking about purchasing B, but you wanted to keep them uh, separate for the for the per possible purpose of transferring them later on as separate parcels, what you could do is you need to ensure that ownership of the one parcel is not uh, held the same as ownership of the other. So if you owned one parcel personally, you could purchase the second parcel uh, through a corporation. There would be two different ownerships. And so those parcels would not merge at law. Once the two properties are merged, say in this example, it's uh, parcels B and C that are abutting, you can't separate those parcels back out again without a municipal consent. And you also can't put a mortgage on just one part of it and then, and then discharge a mortgage off of just one part of the property and not the other. Um, you can't basically cannot deal with that property as uh, as two parts uh, once it has merged in law. The term checkerboarding uh, was used uh, in the past mostly in connection with attempts uh, by lawyers on behalf of their clients attempting to find loopholes in the Planning Act legislation. And if you look at a history of the Planning Act and the uh, the changes that have been made to the act over the years, it's really a cat and mouse game, kind of like the Income Tax Act. Uh, someone finds a loophole and then the uh, legislature steps in to close the loophole. So checkerboarding comes from the idea of uh, squares of the same color on a checkerboard. Um, because under the Planning Act, uh, where two uh, squares meet at a point, uh, like the, the colors of the, the same, uh, or squares of the same color on a checkerboard, those, those are not uh, considered to be abutting or adjacent parcels. So the attempt uh, made by various parties would be to, uh, to create a checkerboard pattern so that you never had a situation where you had abutting properties uh, that were subject to subdivision control. Over the years, as I said, loopholes have been found and they've been closed. One loophole uh, that was closed was the idea of a simultaneous conveyance. You could, you could sever your property by splitting it into two and then selling off each part to a different purchaser at the same time. And, and so at one point, it might have been possible if you did it at the same time, then that would be, um, that would not run afoul of the Planning Act. That loophole was closed. Another loophole related to the Partition Act. There's a piece of legislation in Ontario called the Partition Act. And uh, it's legislation that allows co-owners of property to apply to the court to order uh, partition or splitting of the property amongst owners. The Planning Act's been amended to say that that's no longer allowed. 
If I can just quickly jump in, I know that you've got a couple more topics, but if you want to pick one or rush through them, we'd I, like to get to a few questions if that's okay, sure. John. Sorry to rush you. No, that's okay, Andrew. I, I'm sorry. I knew I had to speak fast to get through this. I'm just going to run through and give a, a very uh, brief uh, overview of the next two topics. So first is easements. And uh, an easement is basically a, a right to use someone else's land. So, um, and, and in the, the, uh, the definitions of an easement, if you have an easement over someone else's land, your land is considered to be the dominant tenement and the land that you're uh, making use of is the servient tenement. Um, easements can be positive or negative. A positive easement is, is where you have a right to do something on the other uh, person's property. A negative easement is where that other person is not allowed to do something on their property uh, in your favor. An example of that would be an easement of support. So say that your neighbor, uh, say that there's a retaining wall on your neighbor's property and without it, your property is going to uh, collapse. Your neighbor might be prevented from interfering or taking away that, uh, that retaining wall. I do a fair bit of work uh, related to pipeline easements and electricity, electricity transmission easements. Uh, up on the screen, I've just got a uh, site diagram of a, a property out in Alberta uh, that uh, was involved in a Nova gas transmission project a couple of years ago. And just by way of example, there, there is uh, the, the easements that were in place over that particular property. So it's one, one farm property and they've got five easements with five different companies. Uh, four of them are are oil and gas pipelines and one is a fiber optic line. Uh, generally speaking, you do need to be concerned about easements. You need to be knowledgeable about the easements on your property. And, and if someone approaches you about entering into an easement, you need to ask questions and you really should get legal advice on that. I'm gonna skip over uh, private fuel outlets. Um, the last topic is, is buried oil and gas tanks. Uh, underground storage tanks on properties are fairly common. Uh, they give rise to a risk of uh, contamination, obviously. And so they're, they're a source of concern for owners and uh, purchasers. The TSSA, governs uh, or regulates uh, underground storage tanks in Ontario. I think just to go back, if you've got questions about a tank on your property or on another property, I think it, it's a, a good idea to consult with a registered petroleum contractor for those sorts of questions. Um, from a lawyer's perspective, uh, what I'd like to, to impart to you today is, is uh, the idea that if you have an underground storage tank on your property and you're looking to sell your property, my view is that uh, you would have a, a duty to disclose the presence of that tank to a prospective purchaser. Uh, I would consider an underground storage tank to be a latent or hidden defect in the property. And because it's underground, obviously the purchaser wouldn't know it's there unless they're told that it's there. Um, for that reason, I would say that if you're looking to sell your property and there is an underground storage tank, you do need to disclose that uh, to a prospective purchaser or else you could run into uh, a, a problem later on with liability once the purchaser discovers that and especially if there is any type of contamination in place. Uh, so I apologize for having to move through so many topics so quickly, uh, but as I said, I think it's worth knowing something about these topics uh, so that at least if, they, if something comes up, you know that there's more information out there that you should be uh, seeking out. And I understand, Andrew, you, 
there's some questions. I, I do have a few questions. So thanks very much for that, John. And I know that is a pile of topics, but we definitely appreciate it because there's no shortage of questions either when you start talking about some of these things. Uh, maybe the first one comes from Jeremy and it kind of, it, it very much relates to uh, the topic you were talking about, buried oil tanks. Um, in Jeremy's case, if he's purchasing a farm with buried oil tanks, are there any laws that he needs to be aware of well, I think, uh, I mean, it's always open to the purchaser to ask questions of the owner and find out, you know, I, I, I talked about a duty on the part of a vendor or seller to disclose that there are tanks. Uh, from the purchaser's perspective, I think you always want to ask if there are tanks and if there are, uh, then, then the question becomes, well, what is the state of the land in, in relation to those tanks at the time that you're you're making the purchase do you need to do you need to do an environmental assessment or require an environmental assessment before you purchase um, I think you want to know what the, the status of the land is before you actually enter into an agreement to purchase and certainly before you you uh, you make that that agreement firm and binding after the once once you've closed the deal and you've taken ownership of the land i think the purchaser basically is is stepping into the shoes of the the previous owner and would be subject to whatever regulatory requirements or or legal obligations the previous owner had with respect to the tenants Perfect. Um, I want to go back to your first topic on trespassing, because I know I've got a question and I see Rick's got a question too. And so I'll kind of combine the first two is, I mean, he's speaking specifically about, um, you know, some signage on the property for the animal care zone part. I know I've heard a few things and of course, Facebook's so factual, um, but you know, you hear that you need that sign that says this is an animal care zone, you cannot trespass. Do you need that? Is it a case of that even, you know, just the regular trespass, a trespass, a trespass act, um does it help to have a sign where does where does all that signage come in well the the requirement for signage uh the the new trespass and food protection act is is much like the the previous and and coexisting general trespass to property act for farmland and for animal protection zones you you get that protection with or without signage so an animal protection zone is an animal protection zone and it's it's uh, subject to or it benefits from the protection of the new legislation even if there is not signage but obviously from a best practices perspective it certainly can't harm uh, it certainly can't hurt to have signage and and i think the the purpose would be you you want to you want to make sure that people coming near those animal protection zones know that it is considered an animal protection zone. I guess it depends on the, the, the circumstances. A, 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 an enclosed barn or feedlot is different than an open pasture, obviously, in terms of how easy it is to put up signage. Um, so all of that to say, a best practice might be to post signs and, and to, to alert people to the fact that that's an animal protection zone. But technically under the legislation, you get the, the protection of the legislation without signage. All right, wonderful. Well, I, I know there's several more questions uh, from, from folks that would like some legal advice, but we are unfortunately out of time. John, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Some people believe in being there for their neighbors and lending a hand when it matters most. There's a difference between working together and just working for profit. And our strong network of insurance companies is proof of that. When you have insurance with your local Ontario Mutual, you're a part of that difference. You're not a customer. You're a member and an owner and a part of something great. It's not the way every insurance company does business, but it is the mutual way. Discover the mutual difference today.